How you doing? This is Lance Hendrickson, and you're listening to WithoutYourHead.com. Welcome to the station of Decapitation Without Your Head. I'm Nasty Neil, and I'm joined by Director Scott Frizzell. Hello. Hey. And the star, <laughs> CD Cats of Moggy Creatures. Woo! Hello. Hey. So, uh, before we start here, can you give people an idea, without spoiling it too much, what Moggy Creatures is all about? Moggy Creatures is all about the manifestation of guilt that destroys a relationship mm. with monstrous cats. <laughs> I think the two go hand in hand. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, what inspired the story? Because I know you also uh, wrote a short story. Yeah. Well, in, in actuality, I was just kind of making some observances at a, at a party. There was a growl outside the house, and people were saying, was it a possum? Someone said, no, it's a bear. And it kind of just kept getting out of control. But it was interesting. Uh, a lot of people sort of couldn't let go of the fact they heard a growl of a creature, and they couldn't. They couldn't, you know, put a visual to it. And I was just kind of, you know, playing around with ideas on a, on another short story, and it just seemed like a great catalyst, mm-hmm. you know, to to open up the action. And it sort of developed from there. Cool. I have to say real quick, I'm, a, I'm in a very rural area. I live uh, right across from a uh, state forest, and uh, possums do not growl. So if you ever hear uh, growl, it's not a possum. Oh, okay. Well, they're <laughs> no, like, well, they're like wanna, the larger know. free-roaming animals we have here in Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. they, uh, they they have a pretty good defense mechanism. When they when they do get startled, uh-huh. no, they no, sound no. a heck of a lot bigger than they look. <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. Uh, Sadie, how did you get involved? Well, Scott and I worked together years ago, seems like a lifetime ago, uh, on House of Bad, where he put us, Three ladies in a house in the woods um, that was a cabin in the woods. Um, and we all ran around into glass of showers. And uh, he decided he's a glutton for punishment and decided he wanted to work with me again. And then he said hairless kittens that <laughs> would grow up to be evil cats. And I was like, damn it, I'm in. It's, yeah. How can you turn that down? <laughs> Yeah. Plus, there was the potential that she might be taking another bath or shower in the film. So, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, now, did you have uh, Sadie in mind for the role of Anna originally, or like when you're writing it? Uh, I, I actually, yeah. When uh, when I wrote the short story, I was just you know completely in the ether, and then when I translated it to uh, a script, I started thinking, well, man, who would be great for this role? I said, who's who's a little bit crazy, but has got some real acting chops and can play a different, you know, a really different character that changes. And I was just racking my mind. And then I literally was like, well, wait a minute. I happen to know one of the greatest actresses in the world for that kind of thing. Um, there's, there's a perfect amount. <laughs> <laughs> there's a, there's a perfect mix of, uh, of innocence and crazy and just being able to deliver a line 10 different ways to Sunday to make any director happy. So, Really, once the script kind of started coming together, I just started picturing her in the role, and it, it just really helped me keep going on the writing. Mm-hmm. And when you read the script, uh, did you uh, uh, what drew you to the character, Sadie? Um, when I read, what did you say? Uh, when, you read, when you read the script, what was it about about uh, the character or the the story that interested you? Um, well, what Scott said is funny. Is she is. You know, there's something, I, I love broken characters, and there's something, you know, really intriguing about the idea that, you know, uh, like most great horror scripts, what Scott does is he kind of turns it upside down, where um, she goes in lots of different places, and that's kind of like, you know, actor gold, where you think she's going one way and she flips the other way, and, you know. Actors love to kind of abuse themselves on screen, and she takes a real beating. So I'm a, I can be a bit of a masochist. So I was ready to kind of jump in on her, and um, and you know what? I actually I I have a secret fear of cats too, and uh, <laughs> there's something about this like slithering these cats, and and it's not just one cat. There's several cats. So I I think it gives 
room to to move. And, you know, he also wrote, it's really about this relationship of this couple. And, and so there's more layers than, mm-hmm. you know, just being a creature feature. So yeah. that kind of makes it a little bit more exciting. There's more going on than meets the eye. Mm-hmm. Now I'm I've always been I like well I like dogs too, but I've always been a cat person. But I have to say the hairless cats are pretty creepy looking. Even before they become monsters or anything. Yeah, they're kind of they're kind of innocuous when you first look at it, oh it's weird, but it's cats being kind of chill. But man, you get one of those things upset when they start to hiss and, and you know, rear up a little bit. They go from being just kind of an odd looking cat to being an absolute little demon, you know. The the wrinkles on the face are so expressive. They just they they just become downright terrifying. Did you ever have any interaction with hairless cats before the before you wrote this? <laughs> Actually, I'd only seen pictures of them. Uh-huh. And uh enough, I when I start when I started kind of enjoying these pictures and all these crazy looking animals, I said, you know what? We got, we got to find out if there's even someone available who can kind of bring one to set and work with it a little bit. And we had a gal show up and brought this uh, the hairless cat that starred in our trailer. He goes by the name of T-Rex. And uh, it was really trippy. I actually was a little bit more frightened of them when I saw one up close for the first time. Her owner is like, hey, just, just reach out and pet him. He's cool. And I remember thinking, okay, I'm going to go out and just pet this guy. And I reached out and kind of turned and looked at my hand, and I just <laughs> froze for a second. She's like, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. So I started kind of playing a little bit and stuff. And what weirded me out was you look at them and you think, okay, they're hairless. So you in- initially think like reptile, like maybe it's going to be kind of cold to the touch or something. Mm-hmm. And in fact, because they don't have the hair to distribute some of the heat, mm-hmm. they're actually almost boiling when you touch them. They're like really, really hot and kind of, kind of sweaty almost in a weird way. So <laughs> like I don't a know. Really I don't... Penis. <laughs> yes. They're like, they're like a, like a penis that's just, uh, getting back from being angry, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of weird. Uh, well, that could be the next movie. The, you have know, attack of angry penises. Could be the follow up. The mutated penis. Of course. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, now uh, on the website, uh, moggy creatures.com. Um, well, on the trailer too, you show how the monsters, uh, the cats mutate into the monsters. I don't, you know, uh, but uh, on there they're really creepy looking. They're almost slimy looking, and it's uh, it's cool. You guys use uh, practical effects. Uh, was that something important to you? Absolutely. Um, when I wanted to make a, a modern creature feature, I was really thinking about the fact that I haven't seen one with a practical effect in a while. And there's there's been there's been a couple that have come out over the over the years, but I don't know. I just uh, they didn't do it for me, you know. I uh, I really wanted to see something that reminded me of oh, like something something on the quality level of uh, like Gremlins or Aliens or you know, just something where when the monster came out and really interacted with the actors, you could, you could see you could really see the interaction happening. Like the, there was just no doubt there was something right in front of them, and they got to react to them there was there was never a time when they're looking at a blank space and pretending it's there they stuck the the puppets right there in place mm-hmm. and i've been working in effects and uh props and whatnot doing effects for commercials for a number of years now and the more i get into the craft the more i appreciate it and i just thought you know this is this is like a great art form that's really being underutilized and there's no reason why we couldn't make a viable horror film with this again. So, and so that just became my mission. Yeah. Did you also work on the special effects yourself then? Yeah, as a matter of fact I did. Um I uh I hired some uh some friends who are big bigger names in the industry when it comes to sculpting and creating. Uh, they kinda of helped me get my vision out there into the into a, a real thing in the world. But once I had that initial sculpt, I actually did quite a bit of the mold work and a lot of the finished work, and I just developed some of the mechanics for some of the sh- scenes. And the things we shot, we didn't reveal everything we shot in the trailer. I have more to show when the crowdfunding mm-hmm. campaign starts next month. So, you know, I, it, was, it was a labor of love, and it was a great chance to work with some people who were extremely experienced in this. Mm-hmm. And uh, Sadie, is, uh, as an actor on, on the film, uh, is it much uh, easier or... or- get a better performance or whatever to work with something actually there over uh, CGI? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it makes a total difference because, you know, Scott's being, Scott's being really modest here because 
really when you, I mean when you held the I, mean, I don't know it we, we call them models or props I guess they're real, they're actually models I mean they they actually moved when you held them so they had kind of puppeteers and um they they not only did they move like when you held them the ears would still kind of have like an echo effect so they they they're almost interactive so when you're holding them there's still like a ripple effect where you're affecting them and they're affecting you so um there's like an excitement where you're they're acting along with you and that makes such a difference Uh, it's a gift to the actor rather than having them you know i don't care how good of an actor you are when you see actors working with like a green screen or you know a, a replacement prop it doesn't have that same thing um and it's i don't know if there's kind of an excitement to everyone on set when we were waiting for you know they were last minute still bringing in some of the pieces and they were like drying and working it out there was like a an excitement in the air on set of like oh my god look at this amazing thing we'll all turn into little kids <laughs> playing with the you know the pieces yeah. and then we're also bringing in you know the this creepy crawly cat and replacing it with each of them and i mean everyone on set knows that we're doing something kind of special because it's so rare that you get to do that mm-hmm. it's really exciting for everyone involved it's it's a gift yeah, even on the uh, pictures on the Facebook page, uh, like you ca- you get that vibe. It seems like everyone's having uh, fun with uh, with the props. Even uh, making them looked like Scott was having a good time. Well, definitely. Everyone's turning into like six year olds. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. yeah. I actually went out of my way to keep those things uh, as hidden as possible. Oh, okay. Uh huh. While oh. shooting the trailer, mm-hmm. I wanted to have a big reveal for everybody in their scene because I wanted to get an honest reaction. You yeah. know. I, and part of that, part of that was to help, you know, bring some energy to the shooting the scene. And part of it was, you know, people's first reactions are usually quite honest. Mm-hmm. So I wanted, I wanted to know if, if people really were creeped out or scared by these things, or if they just thought they were silly. Mm-hmm. And uh, more or less, everybody, upon seeing one of those guys for the first time, they had the same expression on their face. You know, it was like, it really was. Holy crap! I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna be working with that, you know. And I think uh, I I think when I walked up to hand uh, Sadie the, the 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 one of them for the first scene, like she kind of worked with it. And here I want you to hold this like it's a baby, and I want you to like kind of caress it. You know, you're gonna swing over and look at the camera. We're going for reactions, and she definitely <laughs> had a mildly bewildered look. And then I handed it to her, and she's like, "Oh my god, it's 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 heavy. It's got you know." It feels like something, and it, it, it worked out great. I, I loved watching all the actors and even some of my fellow art people that came in to work with me that day uh, you know, support me as a director. Just their amazement and fascination with these things, because really, most people on set had not seen them until the moment I brought them out. Mm-hmm. That's very cool. Yeah, you start coming up with different ideas. So, you know, when I'm holding it, and he says, hold it like a baby, because you're actually holding something with weight, you go, what if I do this? What if I caress the ear? What if I lean in and I kind of nuzzle it? I mean, you're, it becomes much more interactive where, you know, your brain is kind of rapid firing going, boy, what if we did this? What if, you know, mm-hmm. I would do this? I, it just becomes a lot more, um, you know, you get this like childlike energy where it becomes like an improv of having fun of, you know, you want to contribute as much as they did with, making the creatures mm-hmm. really i mean i keep saying it, it's like a gift of you know all the care that he brought into it the actors start lifting off that it's great yeah i'll say even as a viewer i always thought um practical effects when you mentioned weight have a certain weight to them that cgi in film doesn't and it always even if you're not aware of that i think it it kind of takes you out of something if you can kind of tell it's not really there yeah yeah absolutely i mean that's that's a, a big Big key difference. Um, I mean, even even some of the practical effects that are done not so well, mm-hmm. the the fact that you know it's actually there in the scene with the actor, something about it registers as real. Mm-hmm. I think it's a little bit easier to stay in the story and, and enjoy the narrative, and you know, not pop back to reality and start evaluating it, if, yeah. even if it's not great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and sometimes if it's not great, there's a, there's another charm to it too, even being. Uh 
practical. So, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, you had the real cats, and then the creatures are going to be uh, like the, the the mutated cats. Uh, so, like, how uh, when you're designing those, like, do you know how far to go? Because you still want them to look like the original cats, but you also want them to look pretty scary. So, you know, uh, when you're actually uh, talk about like the actual design of uh, of what they would look like. Mm. Well, uh, I think one of the biggest differences that uh, with the mutated cats is they're about 30 to 40 percent larger than your average house cat. And when you're standing there on set and you have the you have the one, the real hairless being cute and being playful, and then it kind of gets near its, uh, its mutated counterpart, you really see the, the muscularity and the, the more ferocious kind of nature in the design. Uh, when I sat down with Julian Ledger, who was a, a creature creator in the biz, I told him I was trying to create a cat. I gave him really light parameters. I said, I want it about this big, and I want some reptilian cues around this and that and the other. And he asked me a, a lot of questions, and he just ran with it immediately. I think he just kind of knew what I wanted. So when he came back with a drawing, and I think that uh, that first 3D rendering is on the Facebook page, and it's certainly been being pumped out on the Twitter page, Twitter feed. Um, he did a great job of taking a cat and making it mo- look a little more ferocious and aggressive. And by doing that, he uh, reduced the stomach and gave it bigger shoulders, so it looked much more like a like a rabid dog in that respect. Uh, he gave it bigger eyes and he gave it bigger ears, which just kind of made it overall a little more striking. And then he added those wrinkles in, like a hairless cat has, but then gave traces of like scaling in certain places. Mm-hmm. So really when you look at it, it's, it's, it's a mildly, mildly lizard like, you know, uh, creature as opposed to just being a bigger cat. Yeah. Yeah. And I uh, say these, you mentioned that you always had a fear of cats Did uh, did doing the movie, uh, make that worse or did, do you think it helped you get over your fear of cats? Well, the cat that we had T-Rex was, was it, it, it never, it, I don't know. I, I guess that breed doesn't really stop moving. I mean, <laughs> well, he so, yeah, he could, yeah, we, we couldn't give him a mark. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, so, and you know, so we're, when we got there, there's a lot of people on set. And, and the thing was, is I'm like, gosh, I'm actually working with like a creature that I'm like, oh, you know, it could probably scratch me. It's a little bit nervous and there's lights and everything. And we had to go out um, and get anchovies and try to get this cat to kind of work with us. So I don't know if it got me over the fear. I mean, I was making jokes to Scott where I said, so, wow, this is going to be like a movie where I'm definitely going to like end with a lot of scratch marks on me. Like, there's no way. <laughs> So, no, I don't think it got me over my fear, which kind of was something that I was using of, of that nervous energy. I tend to be kind of a, a nervous person in general, and which helps me. Uh, so, no, I think I was a little skittish anyway. Um, so, no. <laughs> no, it didn't get me over my fear. Uh, I, 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 think, I think, if anything, working with T-Rex might have reinforced the fear. <laughs> I know, yeah, I think so. Yeah. He, he wasn't I mean, unfriendly. Yeah, creepy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Scott, well, what are your thoughts on, on cats in general? Uh, you know, it, it's interesting, right? They're like... They're kind of a weird borderline animal between being wild and a, and a domesticated pet. Mm-hmm. Um... You know, that that was the pets I had growing up. We had cats, but we lived in a rural area, and it was more like they showed up to get fed, and they showed up when the weather was cold, and they wanted a warm place to sleep. And the rest of the time, they were I was finding carcasses all around the yard, you know, uh-huh. dead birds and snakes and lizards and things, partially chewed, of course. Uh, you know, I don't know. I think they're a good pet for, for the right personality. You know, like some, they tend to be really into one person, and that's, they don't like other people coming in between that relationship. So I don't know. They're just kind of interesting. Not, I'm much more of a dog person. Just dogs tend to be, you know, openly friendly and kind of bodacious and gregarious. And, you know, that's kind of their thing. And I like that, but mm-hmm. certainly uh <laughs> cats, man. I don't know. I think I, I, there, I think there's a reason why people get a little bit nervous around someone who has five or six cats <laughs> living by themselves in their apartment, you know, right, it's right. just, uh-huh. 
something not quite right there. Yeah. Um, cats are like women. I, I think cats are cool. I, it's funny when someone's a cat person, I always think that it's like, um, what I think is cool about it is it's somebody who likes to earn their respect from people. So I understand when someone says, Hey, I'm a cat person. I'm like, okay, you're, you're intelligent, you know, and you want, you want to, you, you respect somebody who makes you work for it a little bit. Um, it, that's what I think I've had a couple of cats in my life that I actually loved. There was a cat outdoor kitty that I lived with for a while. A boyfriend had this cat that he named outdoor kitty, obviously <laughs> for obvious reasons. But and this cat didn't like me for a long time. And one day when he decided to really like me, I woke up and the cat was like on top of my chest, nose to nose. Uh-huh. And that's how I knew this cat loved me. Uh-huh. And I went, I went, what the fuck? <laughs> and my, the guy I was dating at the time said, I think he likes you now. Uh-huh. I was like, great. Good to know. And then this cat was my buddy. Uh-huh. And I liked the cat, but there was always like that creepy factor. Yeah. I got a mouse one day, a dead uh-huh. mouse. Mm-hmm. That's when I knew. So it's not that I don't like cats. There's just a little bit of that kind of edgy quality to them. They're, they're their own. They have their own mindset. Yeah. So my dog's sweet as hell, but you know, I wouldn't call my my dog very intelligent. Uh-huh. No. Yeah, there's all there's the old tale though. When the cat lays on your chest, they're actually sucking like uh, sucking out your breath. Yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. Don't trust the fucking cat, okay? <laughs> to, to try to absorb your soul at that moment. <laughs> What about you, Neil? What, what's your cat story? How many cats uh, do you have? I, I, I don't have any currently, but I always uh, grew up with a lot of cats. Uh, I had one particular cat I had for actually from junior high until just a few years ago, which is well, it was like 18 years I had the cat. Uh, and uh, But like you're saying, it, it only liked me. And I remember I was going to actually bring this up because I was, uh, it was before I had LASIK, so I couldn't see with my glasses very well. I heard the cat scratch the door, let, him in, let her in. And I went to bed, climbed up on me sleeping, and I started petting. And I felt something else there, and it brought a dead mole into the bed with me. Oh, and, uh, oh my God. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Was yeah, do, you think, oh my God. do you think that was a, a gift to you, or do you think that was a warning? I think it was a gift, because when, when I threw it outside, she just looked at me like, I'm never bringing you anything again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It is curious. We have, I know, we have to... <laughs> yeah. But I can't believe there's not more cat movies because there's definitely like a there's an ick factor to cats that even when you love your cat, everyone has some creepy ass story where you're like, and you let this creature back in your house after that. I would have been like, right, no, right. get out. I'm sorry. I love you, but I can't <laughs> handle you out. Mm. Yeah, and, I mean, I have other. Ones. I had one big cat, and he, he brought home. This one was very young. He brought home a, a whole rabbit, which was like honestly as big as he was. Yeah. And he spent the entire day eating the whole thing, and like you couldn't get near him. He'd growl at you and stuff. But I don't know how he could even, because uh, it was honestly as big as him. And he just left the tail, and then I think he got sick afterwards. But. Yeah. Just, well, that's that's the interesting thing, right? Like they go and they kill something. And then they really luxuriate in just picking through the kill, man. Uh, <laughs> it's like more satisfaction than you would have thought would be there, you know? Yes, yeah, yeah. And I had one of the cats that me. brought me a, ma- a, a whole rabbit, and I took it and, and left it go, and he gave me that look again. It's just like, what the hell, dude? <laughs> <laughs> they say cats will eat you. Like, so if, if the owner dies within... I don't know if this is urban legend, but I've I've read this a couple of times on the internet, so I don't know. But they say that cats will eat their owner. The owner dies within 24 hours after the owner dies. The, the mm. cat will start oh. eating the carcass. That, I mean, I, I also had a cat that would have kittens, and I'd give the kittens away. And uh, if the kittens would either be stillborn or they would, they, they would eat the dead kittens, which was always kind of gross, too. But... <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, some, some <laughs> lovely cat stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, Scott, have you ever yeah. ha- have you ever had pet cats? Yeah, we had a number. Of, we had a number of cats oh, growing up. They were, uh, yeah, like I said, they're kind of like visitors that hung out in our yard most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, they didn't come in the house too often unless it was raining or something to that extent. Yeah, but yeah, they're. Uh, I, don't know, I actually one of our cats growing up. He was a fighter. I remember wa- watching him cruise around the neighborhood. And if he saw another cat anywhere, he'd go out of his way to go over and pick a fight, you know, really, really put a, uh, a hit on, 
<laughs> on the neighbor cats, you know, like uh-huh. it just seemed like he really enjoyed the act of being able to smack another cat around. He was he was great at, at walking up slow, and you know everyone's kind of posturing like maybe there's going to be a fight, and he would calm down like oh, no no we're not here to fight, and then all of a sudden he just slapped the shit out of some other cat in the face. Mm-hmm. It was it was always like just a direct challenge like boom here you go what are you what are you going to do about this? Like I challenge you to a duel. Yes. Uh, uh, I don't know. When I was in kindergarten, I remember walking to school. And, you know, I walked a long way. It was the 80s when your parents would let you walk way too far by yourself. And I was, you know, a stringy-haired, tiny little blonde. And uh, I'm walking to school. And I I was born on Friday the 13th. So I was very Mm. superstitious about everything. And there was this black cat that was like walking in front of me and I didn't want to cross the black cat. And so I sat down and this cat sat down and I ended up sitting there for several hours and missed the day of school. And this cat wouldn't, you know, wouldn't leave and stayed far away from me. And uh, I ended up walking back home and I was, you know, I missed the day of school and my mom was like, you know, I, I came home and she was, what are you doing home? And she's yelling and screaming at me and I'm crying. There was a black cat. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I, so I, yeah, mm. I, that was, and I think my mom understood because my mom was afraid of cats when I was younger and wouldn't let them come by her. And let them, they wrapped around her legs. She said that you could get, I don't know, she would say that you could get ringworm if a cat licked you. <laughs> <laughs> so just, yeah, yeah. It's just the thought yeah. of these cats roaming the neighborhood looking to pass ringworm to people. So yeah, I I've chilled out a little bit now. I'll pet cats, and they, you know, I, yeah. I I know most people who have cats that they love, they'll say, "Don't worry, my cat's just like a dog," and I'm like. You know, there, there's cool cats. I know lots of friends with cool cats, but yeah, they normally they're pretty possessive over their owners, and that's why I think this moggy creatures is so it's cool because everybody has their own crazy cat stories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I like to. I, I'm thinking now if you told that to your teacher, like uh, you know, that they asked why you missed school, and you said, "Oh, a black cat uh, followed me." Yeah, I don't remember. Probably not. I mean, I got made uh, fun of as a kid. That would probably be just another story of why I was a weird kid. I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> probably, I probably kept that a secret. <laughs> Scott, you mentioned uh, the crowdfunding. Um, uh, when is that starting? And when? Uh, in uh, what's that for? Because like, how how far along is the movie? Well, the movie is uh, is a completed script. And uh, a certain amount of uh, cat puppets built to do specific gags. Um, we're kind of working on casting at the moment, trying to throw some roles out there to some folks. And that's you know, we're, you know, Sadie's the casting bait. And like they look at Sadie and they say, "Oh my god, I've got to do a movie with that one." Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, but right now we're going to start crowdfunding on the 17th of January. It's going to be a 30-day run, and uh, just really. Boy, hope we get the support to get it off the ground. And I'm not trying to acquire my entire budget right mm-hmm. now. This is going to be start money to get some larger players involved and hopefully attract some bigger talent. Mm-hmm. That's very cool. And now I know you you mentioned on the Facebook like you'll I don't know if you have any ideas yet that you could talk about, but uh, different incentives for uh, uh, being you know help help get the movie made besides getting the movie made itself. We have some set in stone. Um, I certainly. Uh, I foresee having to build a, com- a, com- uh, a total of 10 purpose-built puppets for this uh, movie. So I think I'm going to go ahead and, you know, offer nine of those guys because I don't really think, I don't foresee myself needing to hold on to, you know, 10 Moggy creatures the rest uh-huh. of my life. So, But I think that'd be a pretty cool perk for the that'd average awesome. fan to kind of get into. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm planning on coming out with a Moggy action figure. I'm going to make a little six-inch version that's... Uh, you know, size, properly sized to attack a Barbie and Ken doll when necessary. Uh, what else do I got going? And we're, we're kind of throwing out some other ideas about some different things like uh, giving fans an opportunity to come in and help operate some of the props in some of the key scenes. I'm not sure the logistics of how that'll work just yet, but, you know, obviously 
you're going to have to need to be somewhere near Hollywood and have the time to do it. Uh, but that's, I think that'd be kind of a fun one. Definitely. You know, I'm hoping to maybe get Sadie to take some people out on some dates. That's usually a pretty attractive thing. <laughs> um, you know, no commitments, certainly. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> They've never been on a date with me, so I don't know about that, but let's see. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you know, I'm playing it safe. Uh-huh. Well, those, sure those are some of the big ones. Yeah. Well, I, I think they all sound awesome. I, I, no, that's nothing against Sadie because I was gonna say they all sound awesome, especially like the I was gonna say especially the, the having one of the cats, and then when you added that like a date with Sadie, I was like, well, that's kind of insulting to Sadie if I said like that's the coolest one to me. It's just having one. I'll, one I'll take him out cat. to I'll take him out to uh, girls, girls, girls. <laughs> I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> I'll teach him out a, a night on the town in Hollywood. <laughs> excellent, excellent. With permission from my boyfriend, of course. <laughs> uh, don't mention that think, because then then people will will, will feel uh, they might not. Uh, if don't just don't mention the boyfriend. Like I, don't forget about him. But if, see if you mention it, then they might not want to. Uh... Yeah. A, a true date with me would involve a lot of nagging, an hour in the Uber where I get really quiet and sulk out the window. <laughs> We can argue about the show we watched on TV and how I thought it was a little sexist. I mean, <laughs> I'll drink too much, have them hold my hair at the end of the night. <laughs> it's, it really, it truly is the girlfriend experience. Like. Yeah, it's a girlfriend experience. <laughs> if your girlfriend is, is an actress, like, what was that supposed to mean? Do I look fat in this? What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Neil, what uh, what do you think is a great idea for a perk in a crowdfunding campaign? Well, I I actually love the idea of of I know that would be a bigger one giving away the cat, and I and I also love the action figure. That's the kind of stuff that, that I like is uh mm-hmm. is is uh, fun stuff like that from the movies. So you already kind of covered the ones I really liked. Uh, I have to think mm. about some other ideas, but uh, right there, I think you have something uh very cool going. Another uh, another possibility. I'm not sure if I want to do either just the skull or the complete decorated head because someone asked me, Hey, are you going to do coffee cups? And I just think that's kind of a coffee cup with an image on it. This has got to be like one of the wham, lamest wham. things ever. Right. Yeah. But then I realized I could make an, I could take an actual head and hollow it out and make it to where you could drink. Oh, that, so it. that might be, that's another one that I'm working on the logistics uh, right now. I like that. I, for more simpler things, I'd like the coffee mug, uh, maybe like a, a die cut pin. Like you could, you like a lapel pin kind of idea yeah. of of the of the cat oh. kind of logo you have. That would be. Oh, cool. that's nice. Mm-hmm. So, something you nice you can wear out, you know, to a business meeting. Make a prop. Exactly. You could teach them to make a prop for you know this is a, this is L A and there's so many people who want to learn how to do practical effects. Maybe a workshop at a certain level. Yeah, I mean, it'd be a higher le- yeah, level. Yeah, like a creature but, fab school. Mm. Yeah, don't yeah say- I mean, Scott is really the king of this stuff. Uh, He's really good. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm tooting your horn right now. Please forgive me, Dorota, his wife. But um, you, what was the show that you went on for doing these, you know, rapid oh, I didn't know speed? This. Um, what, what was the show you did in New York for doing these props? Scott? Oh, we did a, we did a show called uh, Thingamabob, and it was briefly on History Channel 2. And it was a challenge show where they gave us three ordinary objects and we had to turn them into working machines somehow. Hmm. And so it was really, it was, it was interesting, you know, like to do things like, uh, uh, we were given a, a, a tuba and we were told we had to build a machine that would help out this, uh, local, um, uh, German brewery and for Oktoberfest. So we ended up combining it with, uh, an electric leaf blower and a beer tap, so the so the host would actually strap this thing on, and he would go out and hit a button and try to play tunes off the tuba, and it would pump beer into people's glasses while they were crowding around him. Uh-huh. And it was it was it was kind of wacky and strange, but the engineering of it was really well covered, where we'd take these different things and kind of mix and match and fabricate all kinds of stuff. And so, I mean, that was the part that seemed to be resonating with the fans, but unfortunately, we didn't get picked up for a, for another season. Hmm. But I did get quite a bit of comments over the next year or two about that one. A lot of people seem to really enjoy that. Mm-hmm. How, did, how did you get involved in uh, making like uh, stuff like that, making effects? 
Well, I actually have an engineering background. I worked in aerospace while I was working through going to school at USC in their writing program. And when I got out, uh, I didn't land a writing job immediately, so I went and worked on Predator drones for a while. <laughs> I did some things of that nature and you know, kind of a handy, crafty guy. And then when I sold the script and got a break and moved up here to Hollywood permanently, um, I just kind of eventually gravitated towards working in that department. I think my first my first real gig in doing effects was on the first season of Ultimate Warrior, if you ever saw that show. We were recreating a lot of uh, different weapons throughout history oh, yeah, really so that sure, uh, yeah. battles could be reenacted. Mm-hmm. That, that, was, is that uh, fun? That sounds like a fun thing to me. That was, it's, it's really fun. You, know, you get to do stuff that you just would never get a chance to do, more or less, and get paid to do it. You know, like... Uh, I've done some really amazing stuff. I've worked, I've built some things that are currently working at Disneyland here in Anaheim and you know, in some of the parades. And I've done a number of things at the Universal uh, theme park that's also right here in LA. A lot of the stuff I've worked on have been in different movies. And I just was really fortunate to get in with a group where people need practical props that, that really do things, you know. Mm-hmm. Sometimes in a movie, they'll ask for, hey, we want a replica of a gun. You know, that's something you can buy or rent, it's no big deal, mm-hmm. but then they'll say, well, we actually want a gun that looks real, and you pull the trigger, and lip- lipstick, you know, comes out the end, and the actress can, you know, paint her lips, and a lot of people would build a prop that does it just like that as described, and we went ahead and did something where you pull the trigger a second time, and it retracts and resets, and it's actually something you can open up and reload with different colors of lipstick, so, you know, bringing the more mechanical aspect into it is kind of the area I gravitate towards. Mm-hmm. So you get to, you know, you get to apply things you learned, you know, work, you know, coupling up a, a small jet to an ultralight aircraft. You use some of that same stuff to make a lipstick gun for Lady Gaga. You oh. know? So <laughs> it's, 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 it, it can be a heck of a lot of fun. Yeah. That sounds awesome to me. Now uh, you mentioned keeping a, a moggy creature and then giving, you know, some way for incentives. Did you keep any of that stuff from, from other movies you worked on or other projects, TV shows? You know, unfortunately, most of the better shows that I worked on, um, a producer or an actor grabs that thing instantaneously. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's part, of the, part of the spoils of being the big name involved. So I don't really have too much. I have a couple of uh, props. I did a Harry Potter thing where I made some replicas of some uh, Hagrid's wand, which is... Which is uh, disguise as an umbrella. Mm-hmm. Um, I, got a, I got a few odds and ends here. You know, most of the things are hanging on the wall in the shop. They're either the first version or the, the spare that got, you know, the head took, you know, taken off of. And mm-hmm. one of the things about working in that part of the world is that if you're in a hurry and you're trying to make a deadline, you're moving, you might have a, a complete structure or something and say, you know what? I really need the electric motor and joint out of that like right now. <laughs> and so everything gets cannibalized really quickly. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's not in a case somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't really last in a shop. So, uh, so I mostly have pictures. Mm. How about yourself, Sadie? Have you kept anything from uh, your previous works? Oh, gosh. Um, well, when I did Wrong Turn 6, we were trying to keep everything. Um, it was <laughs> Fox kind of put, was like putting their foot down on a lot of stuff, like, um, not wanting us to even keep the script, which was funny, um, uh, which I, I kept mine because I had lots of things. But I tried to keep my wardrobe, and then that got sort of taken away. Uh, we we kept, like, the door. What did we? We kept the pictures, which was funny. We kept the pictures from the wall. If you saw Long Turn 6, there was um, the pictures that were used as the props that were, like, they were the flashbacks of the families. So we kept those, um, which was, they, they're kind of locked down that stuff because they don't want you to resell it off eBay. Right. So that's, you know, it's like a big deal. Um, I guess I, I haven't, uh, Blood Thief let me keep some of my jewelry. Marcel was very sweet for Goddess Ishtar. So I have some of the bracelets and the, you know, the earrings and everything, which is really nice. I had a fun, I had, I actually didn't have much of a wardrobe in that. Um, 
them mostly naked in it. So I had a lot of dangles, so I kept those, mm-hmm. so, yeah. which is always kind of cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> I I hope to do something um, where I get to, I guess I can't smuggle any of the cats from Moggy Creatures. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> we, might, we might go ahead and hook you up with a custom one. I don't know. <laughs> it, it depends. On, it depends on your performance, really. So, to see what. Right. <laughs> but I actually got to see Blood Feast, uh, and I had Marcel on the show, and uh, I mean, I'm a huge fan of the original Blood Feast, uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis film. But I, I, I liked the remake too. I thought it was, uh, it was very gory, and uh, and your performance was very good in it. And uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the new Blood Feast. I'm not sure when that actually comes out, but. Uh, well, it's supposed to come out soon, and they're talking about having it do some theaters. That's cool. Marcel's a, a sweetheart. He's actually moving to America, I think, this month. He's supposed to be coming back soon. He, I, I loved working with him. And it's, um, I, I, I was really excited to shoot that in Germany. And um, He's a sweetheart. And I'm glad that you watched it. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's, yeah, like I said, he's a really nice guy when I had him on the show. Yeah. Are, are both of are both of you uh, horror movie fans? I definitely am a horror movie fan. It's it's not the the only genre I enjoy, but mm-hmm. I actually happen to think it's one of the more challenging genres to do right. Uh, there's very specific uh, uh, things that people want in those films, and to get someone to actually buy into your ridiculous concept of an alternate reality, and yet believe that the people on that screen are really going through it, it, it's it's a real skill to be able to guide that kind of project through. So I'm always extremely stoked when I see a horror film that really scares me, or at the very least, you know, makes me just want to root for whoever's trying to survive it all the way through to the end, because it is easy to do it wrong, you know? Yeah, well, I'm a child of the 80s, so I watched a lot of horror growing up and um, a lot of Tales from the Dark Side, if you remember that one, and um, Tales from the Crypt, and I've always kind of, I love Nightmare on Elm Street, and Scream was, you know, a big part of being a teenager, Um I wrote Scorned with Mark Jones, which I think I talked to you about before. Um, he did Leprechaun. And so horror's kind of always been a through line in my life. Um, and and the horror fans are super cool with me and has been very loyal. And uh, as an actor, I always, I, I think it's kind of crazy when people say, like, they don't want to be stuck in horror. They don't... Um, they don't want to only be identified with horror movies. Cause I'm like, well, that's the highest stakes you can play as an actor. It's always life or death. Um, and I, I kind of really enjoy playing crazy characters. And as a female, if you, you know, it, mm-hmm. there's nothing, there's nothing crazier than playing somebody who's that like either begging for their life or taking a life. So, um, I actually really enjoy it. Um, I think it's, the whole term screen queen is now very used, used up. It's kind of like, you know, I, that's a, it's such a broad term. It's like, mm-hmm. cool. If you, you know, call me a screen queen, that's cool. But mostly you're just playing these really rich kind of crazy characters. And I think that's great. I love horror. Yeah. Now, oh, by the way, my uh, co-host here on the show, Annabelle Lecter, could not make it here today, but she did want to say uh, hello to everyone and sorry that she couldn't make it. Oh, Hello. Hi. Yeah, yeah. Big kiss. Yeah, we were in Hollywood uh, a couple years ago. You said Hollywood Boulevard. Everyone warned us not to, but it was. Uh... Yeah, right. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. I'm so disappointed. They go, "This is it." And you go, "Yeah, well, you know, there's it's, Hollywood yeah. is, is kind of a disappointment. They're they're building it up a little bit, but yeah. it's." I don't know. We, we, had, yeah, we had a good time, but people warned us that it would be dangerous. But uh, it was really yeah. I know. dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know. know. Was, you sometimes nowadays think your biggest danger is getting mobbed by uh, the cosplayers that can never seem to <laughs> yeah, get away from the Van Chinese Theater. Yeah, there was. But a, uh, yeah. I don't know. From, from there. Yeah, there was... Well, where where are you at, Neil? Uh, we're I'm in Massachusetts. I'm on the Cape, Cape Cod. I'm not sure if you know where that is, but oh, beautiful. Yes, of course. Absolutely. 
Yeah, it, it's kind of sad because they make it like a big deal. Like you're not you're not going to get mugged in Hollywood Boulevard. Mm. It's just not going to be. It's kind of like a mall there now, and then you have a lot of like the like Scott said, you have the cosplayers, and then you have a lot of homeless people. Um, the problem with Hollywood is you kind of have to drive everywhere to get to the destination. It's real spread out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's where we discovered Uber. And now they have it here. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where'd you stay? Where, where was uh, your hotel? Actually, uh, we rented an apartment because it was actually cheaper than the hotel. Uh, it was right yeah. off Hollywood Boulevard. And it turned out great because I had the washing machine and the whole kitchen and everything. I'm not sure the name of it, but it was uh, it was, it was was just like a... It wasn't far from the Chinese theater because uh, we went out there for a movie premiere. And so we went to stay. It was at the main Chinese theater, which that's not what it's called, I won't think, but... Uh, and so it was, it wasn't far from there, like less than a mile. Yeah. And you thought you were going to the man's Chinese theater, going to the front, right? And it, it ends up being like the back of the man's Chinese theater. <laughs> yeah, it they was, don't open the front anymore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was uh, the premiere of uh, Human Centipede 3 and it was, uh, it was like in, in like the <laughs> side room or cave in the corner. <laughs> Oh great! How'd you like that one? Um, I'm a big fan of Human Centipede and Human Centipede Two, but I can't say wow. I, was, I was the biggest fan of Human Centipede Three. Mm. Oh great! Yeah. yeah. So I I did. I, I have a fun little story, real quick for you. So I did Nipples and Palm Trees with the Asian actor from the first. Oh, Akihiro Human Akihiro <laughs> Kitamura, I believe. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So. So we did this little indie film, Nipples and Palm Trees, with him. Mm-hmm. And he said, so he shows up to set and he goes, oh, man, I just did this movie. And I was so ass to mouth, <laughs> There's this, you know, in uh, this movie. And we gave him a lot of grief. And he said, oh, it's called The Human Centipede. Mm-hmm. And this is before it had come out. So, and he was very funny. And, I, you know, this was a, a comedy we did. And so... We just kept teasing him about the movie, and he goes, oh, my parents are going to be really pissed. They're real conservative and everything. <laughs> and and so we're like, who's going to see that movie? That's gross. And he goes, oh, you know, it's kind of a cool film, though. And so that that becomes like that we keep calling him Ask the Mouth, Ask the Mouth guy <laughs> the whole time we're filming. And this is like a little low-budget indie film we did. Mm-hmm. So then literally a month after we're done rapping, I'm listening to K-Rock, and I, they're talking about a human centipede, and he's on it. Mm-hmm. And I go, son of a bitch. <laughs> and so I'm calling everyone from the cast, and I go, Aki is on, <laughs> he's on K-Rock. And then I turn on the TV, and he's on Hollywood, you know, tonight, or Entertainment Tonight. He is everywhere. And we're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> this is the guy we were just teasing him so much, and he just exploded. It absolutely exploded everywhere. He's blowing up everywhere. Like, yeah. Oh, he was blowing up everywhere, and all of a sudden, you know, we're due, we're due. Yeah, it's completely. But we teased him during the whole time of filming, and he was like, oh, you know, this movie is really embarrassing. It ends up being, like, one of the biggest, most talked about films of the year. <laughs> yeah, and it's, yeah. it's weird because it actually became, like, mainstream because you started to see, like, you know, like on Conan O'Brien and, you know, so, uh, South Park, you know, uh, parodied it, and you, you know, you wouldn't think like this weird horror movie, like uh, about people being so nasty mouth, would would ever be talked about in shows like that. We couldn't even get him at our movie, so you know, he was too busy to come to the movie premiere a year later of our film because he was just like so booked up. Mm-hmm. It, it's like sorry, <laughs> <laughs> which was you know not not his fault. It was great for him, but. He was sort of like, while we were filming, like, oh, God, I'm so ashamed of this film I did. Uh, Such a nightmare. I'm so glad I have this film, or Nipples and Palm Trees, <laughs> which wasn't called Nipples and Palm Trees at the time. So that's an you know, he's like, oh, I'm so glad I have this film, which is called, like, Day in the Life or something. Oh, we renamed it. But, like, I'm so glad I have this legit film to fall back on. Yeah. <laughs> and that film ends up blowing up, and we're like, hey, you want to come to our film premiere? It'd be really good for us. And would be like... Yeah, that would be great, except I'm flying to London and I'm flying to, you know, Paris, I'm flying to Paris and then I've got to go. He was on a press tour for like two years in that film. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, go, you you bastard. Really, <laughs> actually a very funny, talented comedian, uh-huh. I, you know, but he was on tour forever on that 
everywhere. Mm. Lucky bastard. <laughs> yeah. uh, oddly and enough, you know that, go on. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, oddly enough, say that, how I met Annabelle was through Human Centipede, which sounds very bizarre, but that, that's... <laughs> you you met her at a theater? Yeah. I met her through a... Uh, what happened was I had Dieter Lazeron, who plays the doctor in the first movie, Dr. Heiter, and then... Yes. Uh, uh, she had painted, because uh, she's an artist, uh, before she's doing the show, and she's still an artist, and she painted a picture of Dieter, and I commented on it and said, hey, I just interviewed him. And then, well, we started to talk, because um, most people I know don't don't like human centipede movies, and people she knows doesn't either, and so then uh, that's how the friendship started, through human centipede. It was the, the, the mutual weirdness catalyst. <laughs> exactly. It's pretty good. Yes, yes. You know, it's an interesting thing we've been talking about, Human Centipede, and like uh, having a role in it, and saying, "Oh, you know, I did this movie. I'm really embarrassed, or my parents are going to kill me, or whatnot." Mm-hmm. You know, there is something to be said for you know showing up for for a project like that, which is going to be controversial, no matter no matter how it comes out, and just approaching it like a professional and and doing the absolute best you can on it. Mm-hmm. Because I've worked on a lot of low budget movies as an assistant director in that you know in that chain of of the business. And it's really disappointing to look at, you read a script and think, you know what, this, this could be a charming little film or I see what we're going for here. I think we can make this happen. And then watch half of your actors and sometimes even your director just go, well, you know, we, we're getting paid. We're here. Let's just do it. And, and approach it with, you know, no vigor, with, with no, you know, professionalism. I mean, it takes guts to, to show up for something where maybe you, you think there's a weakness in the script or maybe even you just think your, your, your staff around you just don't care. It takes a lot to just say, you know what, I'm going to do the best I can because you never know who's watching. You never know how this is going to, how it's going to shake out. I want to do the absolute best I can with what we have here. Yeah, and I think that's, I think that's something that's actually missing in a lot of uh, larger budget films. When I say larger, I mean larger than the independent scene, mm-hmm. but you look at a, a $30 million comedy uh, that gets, that gets released in theaters these days. And I'm not going to name any, but I, you know, we, I think we all have an example in our head where we say, wow, there's some big name people in here and there's just not a lot of effort happening on the screen. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's hard to believe we, we had that much money. We assembled all these creative people and there's just, there's no magic happening, Mm -hmm. you know? And I, I, I really feel like that's, that's kind of a bit of a plague that, that gets into some people's heads once they reach a certain level of success. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, when we yeah. had, when we had Lance uh, Henriksen on years ago, and he talked about doing Piranha Two, I think it was like his first movie, and James Cameron directed that. You know, and obviously both went on to to uh, be big stars. But uh, you know, he kind of said about that, like uh, a lot. Some of the people would go into a movie like that and just think, "Ah, oh, it's Piranha Two. It's, it's you know, it's going to be this stupid horror movie." But uh, he went in and gave it his all, and James Cameron gave it his all, and that's how, like, you know, their friendship started and, you know, went on to uh, to do a lot mm-hmm. of things. And I also think, um, I think you can see that in a lot of independent movies, which uh, can elevate it. Like, even if maybe it's not the best movie, like, if you could tell the people are giving it their all, like, they have uh, some love for uh, the script, for what they're doing, and, uh, you know, it elevates it. It makes it, you know, mm-hmm. more, more than what it would be. Well, that's Sharknado. I think that's what happened with that. It, it was so ridiculous. And then you had these, you know, 80s actors or 90s actors uh, played it straight and went for it. And even though it was so ridiculous, Ian Zaring and uh, Tara Reid, they just kind of jumped into it, like looking really grateful to be cast in this ridiculous thing. And everyone went, yeah, Sharknado. And, <laughs> and everyone was scratching their heads. But I'm like, I don't know, or snakes on a plane. Everyone went, yeah. This, I mean, people sometimes like that. I always think I, I get excited every time I'm shooting. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go for it. I mean, mm-hmm. Blood Feast was kind of fun because Marcel is like the most passionate director and he wanted to redo Blood Feast so badly mm-hmm. and he wanted to do a really sleek version of it. Mm-hmm. And the actual premise of Blood Feast is kind of, um, you know, very uh, silly, yeah. but he wanted to, he, you know, said, I want to do this really sleek kind of sexy version of it. Mm-hmm. And his enthusiasm got everyone on board to do that. So, um, I think Scott's right. Uh, I mean, that's how I met Scott when we did House of Bad. They were like 
so um, enthusiastic about about doing this low budget film, but really doing it um, serious and and really dramatic, and they cast mm-hmm. um, myself and Heather and Cheryl, and so you know uh, we all had theater backgrounds and said you know we want this to be really good acting. We don't just want you know, I made a joke about us taking a lot of showers, which we did, but, you know, they wanted real <laughs> tears. <laughs> they wanted real tears falling down our face and uh. stuff. And I, that's, I like watching horror where I'm really, like, into it. I mean, I love The Purge. Like, I think The Purge has done super, super well. I also saw, Neil, did you see The Invitation? I yeah. thought that was awesome. I don't think I have, actually. It's pretty it's good. Like Scott, where they're, yeah. they're in Hollywood Hills and they're doing a dinner party. Uh-huh. I thought that was one of the best uh, horror films that came out last year. It was, I think it's been a year. It's pretty creepy and wonderful. It's great. Or Knock Knock with Keanu Reeves was a little bit, I thought it could have been better, but there was a certain commitment to those knuckleheads. Mm-hmm. Pretty good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think uh, going, sticking with our theme here, if you want to see a really great example of, uh, of people being committed to making a story work, and maybe being hamstrung by a budget or whatever it might be, you can look at these B movies, um, these B, B horror films of the fifties, especially sci-fi and monster movies. I'm going to bring one out that I just popped into my head. It was called, you know, the the monster that challenged the world, and this was this was set in the Salton Sea of all places, and I believe there was a radioactive uh, mutated mollusk. <laughs> it was eight feet tall <laughs> and was terrorizing the town of Salton Sea, which is like all about eight people. And you and you watch this film, and the funniest parts are when this giant mollusk comes out of the water to attack somebody. You know, <laughs> it it can't be seen as anything other than comedy now. Uh-huh. But in the moments between the monsters, you see people working through this dialogue and playing out this drama. Of this, this is a high stakes game of life or death, and if we don't do something about this, all humanity is going to be lost. And you know, and then cut to cut to the, the giant rubber mollusk. But <laughs> but the the commitment of those actors to make that work would show through. Mm-hmm. You know, you would just you watch this and say, you know what? Like when we're not looking at the giant rubber mollusk, this is actually a pretty <laughs> compelling film. Uh-huh. Everybody here seems legit. You know, you want to you really want to see how this plays out. And, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing, like when we did House of Bad together, the thing that I absolutely loved about working with uh, Sadie and our other two cast members, Heather Tyler and Cheryl Sands, was that, you know, they, they went after it. They, they were completely committed, and they brought a lot of emotion, a lot of depth to the, to the role. Yeah. Singing the praises of some people from House of Bad, but uh-huh. that's... Uh, <laughs> well, I, I was just going to say, that's the thing that I really brought Sadie to mind too when I started working on the script for the smoggy creatures what is that I knew no matter what I asked her to do as far as a performance you know she might have her input on it in different ways but she would certainly give it her best whatever we're trying to accomplish that moment Mm -hmm. but where can you uh, see House of Bad because I'm actually really curious to watch it now oh boy I think we're we're on just about every video on demand platform with the exception of Netflix. I know you can see us on Amazon. I know we can be seen at Hulu, uh, Sony PlayStation network, the Xbox network. Uh, I don't think that we have a physical presence in uh, any rental stores anymore because frankly here in LA, I don't know where you can rent a video anymore. I don't think but, uh, in here either, so yeah. Are we still on iTunes? We are, yes. As a matter of fact, we are still on iTunes. Mm-hmm. So please go to your Apple TV yeah, and check it out. I'd like to. And when Moggy Creatures is finished, um, where do you plan on? Um, you know, how are people going to be able to see it? Is it going to be on video on demand, on DVD, or at theaters? Uh, well, I'm still kind of exploring some of those options. Um, you know, distribution is changing, like like constantly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've gone to the American film market two years in a row and talk to distributors about what their plans are. And I, I feel like half the distributors that right now who have an established business aren't really sure how to keep things moving and capitalize. Um, I would love to, just for horror fans, 
start with a, a small theatrical run because I want this to be the kind of film you can go watch on a big screen and really mm-hmm. appreciate cinematography. Um, the, the guy I've got working the camera for this film, uh, uh, our good buddy Chad from House of Bad, he's really adept in working with, the, with digital media, and we're planning on shooting it in digitally. Uh, I would just really like to take a moment to see that on the big screen. Mm-hmm. And then from that point on, it's, it's going to be whatever ends up being the best option at the time. Now, whether that means an exclusive run through Netflix or Amazon or perhaps a, a different outlet, I don't know yet. But certainly, you know, I'm going to do my best to get it out there so everybody can see it. Yeah, um, actually, you uh, mentioned uh, theater. There, I always say this on the show, really, uh, you know, it's great to watch a movie on, on, your, on your computer, your TV and stuff, but uh, watching a movie in the theater is, uh, is really a totally different experience to, to watch really how it's supposed to be seen. I totally agree. I think uh, it's, it's a shame that uh, it's, it's, we have this wonderful convenience that brings all, the, all that stuff right to our house, mm-hmm. and we, like everything else in our society, we've gotten kind of lazy about I'm just going to sit here on the couch and hit a button and bring it up. And that's great. But, you know, I, I make it a point to go out and go to the theaters and just watch something, something I didn't even plan on seeing. Mm-hmm. And I, that experience, you just, it's not matched anywhere. It's, it's, you got, you got to, you really got to see movies on the big screen. That's, that's where they were born. And I think that's where they're going to ultimately, they're, you're, they're always going to have a presence there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have some uh, in Boston uh, that show uh, you know older movies, and uh, they do like midnight movies on the weekend. It's usually usually horror stuff for some kind of weird movie. And uh, even if you've seen it a bunch of times on TV, whatever, to go and watch it on the big screen, it's uh, such a different experience. Yeah, and, and speaking of the midnight movie, you know that's uh, that's where I saw Rocky Horror Picture Show for the, for the first time, and right. a number of other things. <laughs> I would love for Moggy Creatures. You know, to be to be known as a as a mainstay around the country as a midnight movie, uh-huh. and the theaters still do it. I think it's it's going to be that kind of film where there's going to be you're going to have the right amount of scares and the right amount of escapism as a as a viewer. You know, you're going to want to get in there and watch it and really get creeped out in that dark theater. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I see a lot. I haven't obviously seen the movie yet because it's not finished, but I see a lot of screeners on the show and a lot of trailers. And uh, Moggy Creatures right away stuck out to me because uh, uh, well, Sadie looked very uh, 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 convincing in, in her role, and also the the creatures are very cool. So it, it it definitely stood out to me as something like I definitely would like to see. And so I've been posted on Facebook, and all you know my horror f- uh, uh, friends are uh, really excited about it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I thank put a lot know. of effort into trying to. Oh, what's that, Sadie? I said thanks, Neil. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> There it is. You know, we uh, we played around with some. We had an actual script. We went into that to shoot that trailer, and I had some difficulties getting some things done, mostly due to logistics. And then we actually lost a portion of sound uh, when it came to doing some dialogue scenes, which I actually had intended to build the trailer around a big dialogue scene. And uh, so we ended up just going with just some of the great looks and the reactions of the actors, and I think that really got the point across. And again, I think our cinematographer. Chad Courtney did a nice job of making those creatures work in those moments you get to see them. Uh, and I really, and when I was putting that trailer together, it was always in my mind that, you know, what I show people here, I can't say, can't say to them, okay, but this will look better when I get to the full feature. So, you know, give me some slack. Mm-hmm. I knew I had to do the absolute best I could at that moment. And so, you know, that's kind of how we approached it. So there were some other things we shot that, also, we'll never see the light of day unless by maybe in a behind the scenes reel or a retrospective, just because I wanted to put our best foot forward and I wanted potential fans of the project to say, yes, that is the kind of thing that I've been waiting to see. And that's, you know, kind of my little promise there with that, with that trailer is I'm going to bring you at least this quality or better, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually have one quote here actually from, because uh, I put the trailer up on our YouTube. They sent me the trailer to, to you know, upload. And, um, my friend uh, Mike Terry here, he said, as, as if I needed another reason to hate cats. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, well, there you go. Which in a positive way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, by the way, how can, uh, what's the best way to, uh, I was going to say find you guys, but that sounds like stalking you, but where's the best way to follow you guys online? Well, we are 
we are we have our own website. It's moggycreatures.com, and that's M O G G Y creatures for anybody who's paying attention. And we also moggy creatures on Twitter, moggy creatures on Instagram. Mm-hmm. So we're kind of we're kind of everywhere, really. You just gotta gotta look for us. Mm-hmm. And uh, Sadie, how about yourself? Uh, how can people uh, uh, find you online? Uh, either through Moggy Creatures or Sadie Cats uh, through Facebook or Instagram, S A D I E K A T Z, um, or on Twitter, uh, Sadie yeah. underscore Cat. You know, and that's K A T Z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well I'll put the links <laughs> up on the website too. So, if you, I would right. say if people can't spell, but that seems that seems mean. If, it's just easier to, to click on. And, uh, thank you so much for having us. Thank yeah, you, thank you. Thank you both for coming on. Yeah, thank you guys right. for making some time for us and letting us share the project with you. Yeah, excellent. This is Herschel Garden Lewis. If you know who I am, God help you. If you don't know who I am, God help you. But what you're watching here or listening to is without your head. And I can tell you that I have contributed to the loss of your head. So thank you for being there.